okay so good afternoon everyone and uh, uh, first of all i'm so sorry uh, you know because we have uh, you know postponed this class for 3 weeks uh, but definitely uh, you know there was some uh, you know unavoidable reasons uh, at our end so we could not conduct it on the date uh, you know we actually kept on 31st july but today uh, you know we are uh, keeping it and we are uh, going to start it uh, and this is uh, you know one of the most important wonderful master class from climate research solutions on research methodologies and ethics and uh, you know this master class is going to cover uh, you know definitions and why to do research categories of the research research methods and research methodology procedural steps in research research strategies epidemiological studies observational and experimental studies and research ethics so uh, you know it's very important whether you are a student you are a researcher or you are in academics it's very important to uh, you know excel your career uh, so you need to publish some papers you need to you know conduct some research you need to you know go for some uh, experimental studies or uh, maybe observational studies or to write some uh, you know papers whether it is review paper or something so you know for the promotions also for the uh, you know your own uh, you know a uh, cv purpose your own career purpose you need research methodologies and ethics is very important part of uh, you know our life in pharmacy medical field and uh, you know whatever health science uh, you know stream you are from so it's very important so today to discuss this research methodologies and ethics uh, we have with us dr kanav khera so uh, dr kanav khera is associate professor at lovely professional university uh, punjab and uh, he has done his phd in clinical pharmacy Uh, from Manipal Academy of Higher Education, MCOPS, Manipal College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, so, uh, you know, with that note, uh, you know, and sir is also, uh, you know, into the various committees, uh, international committees, and he has, uh, you know, guided thousands of the students on research methodologies and, uh, you know, other perspectives at Manipal. He has a vast experience of 15 years at Manipal College of Pharmaceutical Sciences before uh, lovely professional university. So. Uh, over to you sir thank you very much for accepting the uh, invitation over to you sir uh, for the class thank you very much everyone for joining okay uh, thank you dr raji uh, so i think it's around 2 3 hour lecture so we will go like mostly interactive mode and then powerpoints and some of the resources uh, i will be discussing with the students so i will be requesting all the students uh, so that they can interact so when it comes to the research i think most of you will be from pharmacy background or other medical backgrounds so research as we all know it's a very important part of uh, today environment because and especially when we talk about not only research ethics actually is now attached ethical research so whenever like most of us when we do research especially human research so ethics plays a very very important role uh, in order to carry out Uh, ourselves all these research so i will be showing you some of the documents and then we will be discussing them in much more detail and i will be showing you various resources because as a researcher uh, even if we know research and ethics research and if we don't know from where to get our knowledge updated because knowledge is very versatile nowadays and it keeps on changing nowadays so the guidelines keeps on changing regulatory norms keeps on changing the newer research is going to come for example if you talk about 100 years back what type of research we were carrying out and what type of research at present is going on especially during pandemic time and maybe what type of research will go in the next 50 years maybe in your whole career will be totally different and lot of new things will come out for example uh, as we had seen research in india the year 2019 was one of the i will say the game changer in uh, history of clinical research because government of india has come out with a uh, new regulations uh, with respect to clinical research so i will be showing you some of the resources before i start uh, i hope this is visible uh, anyone can tell me about whether they know about this particular yeah, document anyone has seen before yeah. anyone anyone can tell anything about this document yes please interact guys what is this document all about because this is from where the whole medical research starts the ethics starts because this is a landmark document 
in science. And if you don't know this document, then definitely uh, there is a lacking part uh, in the research. And in science community, whether we are doing academic research, whether we are doing uh, clinical trials, this is a document which plays a very important role. So this document is known as Declaration of Helsinki. And it's given by World Medical Association. So this was a document because whatever we do now, there is a past which is linked with it. So something has gone wrong in the past, what we are seeing now. So in order to make the corrections, whatever we had done wrong, the research, the people involved in research, whatever wrongdoings they had done. So the world community came together and they had framed this document. I will be talking more on this document. So just to give an idea about this document, this document was adopted in 18th century. Uh, uh, it's like, uh, you can say there are various amendments. It started in year 1964. So around more than 60 years, more than 60, 65 years are there. This document is there. But the beauty part of this document is, this document is updated on a regular basis. So even recently, uh, during COVID time, this document has been updated. So this document give you understanding of all basic principles of all medical research, uh, whatever we are carrying out. Anyone can tell what are the various landmark events, what went wrong in the past? Anyone can give a light on that? Anyone have any idea? Any landmark events in the history of mankind in ethics? Yes, anyone? Anyone want to share? Anyone knows about uh, Nazis experiment, World War II, what type of experiment they used to carry out? Then there are some other landmarks events like Turkish syphilis studies, Thalidomide disasters. Anyone wants to share any experience? Maybe you had studied in your regular curriculums. Yes, anyone wants to share? Yes, anyone? Okay, so before we go further, uh, I will just show you some of the documents. Uh, give me a second. These are some of the guidelines for your references. These are the guidelines given by CDSCO. These are the guidance for the industry because many of you will be joining industries very soon or you may be already working with the industry. So this guidelines give you a very good understanding of how we have to conduct clinical trials, how the submission of clinical trial happens, how the new drug approval process happens, post-approval changes in biological products. Okay, so this is a very important document given by uh, CDSU. Then there is another document which we very regularly use in a setting. So maybe some of you mean schedule Y, which is another very important document when it comes to clinical trial. Anybody is aware about 2019 updated guy, uh, document by government of India? So first I want to give you a, just a little understanding so that before I go for yes. Okay, so I will just show you also. I will just show you how to search the document also. In so let's start uh, today's topic, research methodologies and ethics. So myself, Dr. Kanav, uh, so I have been working in this field for the last 15 years, as Ajit has already told. So to begin with, uh, as we all know, as a humans, since many centuries, we are, humans are always curious to know new things and to discover new things. And if we see in last 100, 200 years, there has been a lot of progress in the science. And what we are seeing research in the next 50 years, whatever we are doing now, maybe next 50 years, the research may totally change. The how the research is coming next, like artificial intelligence, robotics, okay, automations, and research in uh, new areas like pharmacogenomics, pharmacoeconomic research, okay, genetic level research, stem cell research, and clonings and many other areas. So humans, as you can see, they are always curious. And as we know that artificial intelligence is actually touching each, each and every area. So maybe in future, whatever the protocols or research protocols are coming out, already in some places, we are already seeing some 
uh, research in humans using artificial intelligence, automations, already it's happening. So our humans are always curious about research. But a properly planned and executed clinical trial is a very powerful experiment technique for assessing efficacy of an intervention. Because it's a very powerful, as we know, medicine, if we understand medicine or drug, drugs given properly via a proper channel, it can save lives. But a drug in a wrong hand given wrongly can take lives also. So that, that's what the magic of drugs are. So even they can save lives and even they can take lives. So when we talk about clinical trials, as we had seen that in last two years during the COVID time, there has been a lot of new interest even in the general public, which were never had heard about any name of clinical trials, people had been now aware about clinical trials, that it's a systematic study of new drugs in humans to generate data for discovering or verifying the clinical pharmacological and adverse effects with objective of determining safety and efficacy of new drugs. So anything which is to be dealt with the new drugs comes under the umbrella of clinical trials. So let's start uh, with a little bit on the history part. And we will be linking it with the current scenario, challenges, some market scenarios, and then we will be jumping on to research methodologies. So starting with the history of ethical guidelines, this is a landmark picture, which as a researcher, I think this is from where it all started. The newer interest in the field of ethical research, it started from here. So the Nuremberg Code of 1947. So in the image, you can see these are the Nazis physicians which are being tried in the code of law, which are being tried for their inhuman experimentation done on humans during World War time. So during those days, you can see over here, these are all war prisoners, which has been kept. Uh, these are the Nazis war prisoners of the World War. They had been jam packed in racks and they are treated like guinea pigs and they were being part of experiments which are inhuman experiments like experiments on twins so they used to be doing some experiments on twins they were doing some experiments like freezing experiments in which they, they will be taking the prisoners and they will be dipping them in ice cold water they want to see the effect of uh, hypothermia and also the recovery phase then there are some malaria experiments over here you can see there are thousand war prisoners which are being actually infected with malarial parasites and then different drugs were tested on them and then they want to see which one survives and which one died. So these are some of the books and apart from these, there are various other experiments like uh, sulfonylamide gas experiments in which the prisoners were kept in the gas chambers. The gas will be released, poisonous gases will be released and they will be seen that how the, uh, you can say burns and injuries related with these toxic gas and how the patient recovers, patient recovers. And these are some of the books which has been published on war crimes. The trial of war crimes of Nuremberg military tribunals had been published. So very important to know that most of these patients or prisoners which were being tested in these uh, experiments, they had never given a consent. The prisoners had never given their consent about participation in their trials. And by the end of the experiment, most of the patient died. Other landmark even over here, you can see it is a Turkish syphilis study. Over here, you can see there are some black individuals which are standing. And you can see over here that there is a physician which is actually giving and taking blood samples of these people. So it's a very important case study for all of us to know because it gives us a very important learning because how we do research nowadays, somewhere or the other, the history is linked with it. So it was a prospective study, which is funded by US government, US public health services. And initially this study was actually meant for only six months, but this study went unnoticed for around 40 years down the line. So for all these 40 years, and it, the worst part is it was sponsored by the US government. So around 600 <clears throat> patients were involved. Most of them were poor, they were illiterate, and mostly they were from ethnic, ethnic minority group that is a black man. And out of 600 odd people, nearly 400 people were having syphilis and other were not having syphilis. And the study was followed for 40 years. The worst part was the patients were never informed about the condition, what they are having. So they were never told the correct information to the patients. So the patients were never knowing that they were having syphilis. 
they were told that they were having bad blood and no consent was taken the patient consent was never taken not only that in early 19th century when the penicillin was discovered so penicillin actually became the drug of choice for treatment of penicillin and as we can see the clinical trial nowadays if any by chance for example if any patient is participating in a clinical trial okay and new drug therapies becomes available so by law what law says we have to offer this treatment to the patient okay and we have to not only offer but actually we have to make the patient aware that look when we started the trial this treatment was not available and now there is a drug which is available in the market which may be having a beneficial or a risk factor so we have to actually tell and update the patient but in these studies the patient were never offered any treatment which could have cured syphilis for them so these up were some of the ethical principles which were violated during these studies like the principle of beneficence like benefit should outweigh the risk and as we know nowadays whatever research human research we do we have to always go for risk and benefit balance so the risk should always be less the out is the okay that's what we had seen even in the vaccination during vaccination trials this principle sometime doesn't fit of risk and benefit but definitely all the regulatory bodies do look into it we will be talking on uh, you can say emergency clinical trials also in my coming slides but most of the time i will say 95% of the time the benefits should always outweigh the risk and also in this turkish experiment the respect for autonomy that is voluntarily consent and freedom to withdrawal was never executed truth telling that is telling the truth to the participant about their disease condition about the alternative treatments available but never carried out and the justice equal access to benefits and risk of the research which was also not prevailed and also the vulnerable group of population were also targeted in this particular research so that is another. so this is a news heading in the times uh, in the new york times which actually brought this into limelight and even the president of america has to came forward and apologize in early 2002 or 2004 to the public of uh, like to the general public of us and the survivor of turkish syphilis study that the government of us has done wrong to the patients so there was a public apology for that so based on these two events that is turkish experiments and uh, you can say nuremberg code there was a belmuth report which was launched in early 1976 so the belmuth report was issued in 1979 by us national commission for protection of human subjects so it gives you three basic principle that is the principle of respect principle of beneficence and principle of justice so principle of respect it should recognize autonomy of humans and requires clear informed consent principle of beneficence uh, must be research must be shown to the beneficial and reflect the hippocrate idea of do no harm principle so do no harm is a very important principle so knowingly we should not carry out or we should not do any harm to any individual if you know that for example I, if you take today's clinical trial if the investigator thinks that okay his patient will be at high risk so it is the investigator or the doctor's responsibility to withdraw the patient from the risk because he thinks now if he continues participating in the study he the more harm will be done so that should not happen he should be withdrawn so principle of beneficence which applies today is principle of do no harm to anyone then is principle of justice the benefit to some must be balanced against the risk of the subjects so principle of justice we will be studying more in our coming slides and this is another very important landmark historical event that is the thalidomide uh, disaster of 1960 and i think as a researcher i think most of you will be already knowing it and those who don't know i will just give you a brief understanding so this disaster happened in you can say thalidomide became one of the very popular drug and over the counter drug which was launched in 1957 for taking care of morning sickness in pregnant women and it was launched in west germany under the label uh, also was there so this drug was primarily used as sedative or hypnotics and it used to take care of anxiety insomnia gastritis in pregnant women for morning sickness and soon it became over the counter drug so anyone any pregnant woman can go and take this drug from the counter 
But immediately after the launch of this molecule, nearly 5,000 to 7,000 infants were born with malformation of limbs, that is focomalia, and around 40% of the children only survived. And those who survived also, they were having some or the other sort of, you can say, abnormalities. So why I'm showing you the history? Because the clinical trial designs, the study designs, the epidemiological research designs, which we are going to study in my next part of my lecture, all these study designs, somewhere or the other, the history is linked. So based on the thalidomide disaster, there was a Harris Amendment Act, which was given by US government. So what is this Harris Amendment Act, which was given in 1962 by the US FDA, that is Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act in US, so what they do was it introduced a requirement for drug manufacturer to provide proof of effectiveness and safety of their molecules before approval. So nowadays, whatever the molecule we can see in clinical trials, before the drug is approved for human use or before it is launched in the market, we see that Harris Amendment Act plays a very big role in that. That is, the companies and the regulators have to make sure whatever the drug is launched in the market, it is effective and safe so that the required approval can be given. Without this, it cannot get approvals. So this Harris Amendment Act makes sure that effectiveness and safety is there okay, for the approval process. And then finally, in 1964, after all these disasters events, all this inhuman experimentations, unethical practices, Declaration of Helsinki was came into picture and World Medical Council came together. That is experts from physicians, other experts, ethical experts, medical experts, all over the world came together to frame this particular regulation. In now 2021, in 21st century, whichever clinical trials are happening, and if you are involved, any investigator, any researcher, they have to sign an undertaking that whatever research they are doing, it is as per declaration of Helsinki. So you have to give a declaration that you will follow the principle of, you can say, Helsinki. So what are the main principles? The very first one is safeguarding the research subject, informed consent of, for the participants, minimizing risk, and adhering to the approved research protocol. Nowadays, whenever any researcher in any education institute, and even in the 2019 clinical trial guidelines, which I was talking about, even in that guidelines, it has been mandatory that they had made actually two separate domains now. That is one is called as, you can say, academic clinical trials, and the other part is commercial clinical trials by the pharmaceutical companies. So in that 2019 clinical trial guidelines, they had separated. But one thing is common in both, that whatever the research, either at academic or either at institutional level, whichever you are doing, it should get an approval through a research protocol. There should be a research plan. There should be a protocol which has to get approval from the regulators, from the ethics committee. In your hospitals, you will be knowing them as institutional ethics committee or ethics committee. By different names, it has been known. Okay, till now, anyone have any doubts? Anyone have any doubts? I will be happy to answer. Okay, so this is the summary of what we had just uh, taken up. These are some of the key landmark events, which you can remember again. So it all started with Hippocrates Oath. In hello. Then, hello, yes, please. Excuse hello. me, sir. Yes, please, tell. Sir, uh, about uh, Nazi experiment, uh, when it was, uh, you have said in the slides that, uh, Penicillin was, uh, even though it was introduced, uh, the yes. treatment was not given. Yes, exactly. Um, then uh, how can the person uh, was alive? Means, uh, okay. is there any, uh, have they done any cure rate or anything? Okay. Uh, so basically, it was not in the Nazis experiment. It was the Turkish syphilis study, which was under US government. So in that Turkish syphilis study, what they had done was, Basically, the study was actually meant to study the, you can say, disease profile of syphilis. Because syphilis in those days was known as black death. And there was no known cure when the study started. So the science in the US government, the research team want to understand what are the different stages of syphilis, how the disease progress, and if it is treated, how the patient will be reacting to that. 
so during that course those patient who were recruited in the beginning they were never given any opportunity or any treatment they was were observed throughout and they were actually bribed you know they were bribed to participate in the study because first of all they were very poor they were very very poor vulnerable group they were black so what they were offered was they were offered free you can say meals they were offered free burial insurance that means even if they die the government will take care of their burials because they cannot afford it a proper respectable burial after the death so that's how they were bribed they were never offered any treatment even after 5 10 years the penicillin was available but these people were never offered any treatment so that's what the unethical practices happen in those days is it clear any doubts i hope it is clear yes sir thank you okay anyone else anyone else have any other question sir can you explain more about uh, belmont uh, report sir okay uh, so belmont report okay you want to okay so over here you can see the belmont report it is the ethical principle and guidelines for protection of human subjects of research so the belmont report was the first document which gives and talk about the protection of human research subjects so it basically summarize the ethical principles of whatever has gone wrong in the past these were the three main principles which surrounds and belmont principles i will be discussing in my few more slides okay just give me few minutes i will be discussing around 15 principles which are surrounding the belmont report okay we will be talking on that okay in my coming slides so shall we go ahead so maybe next couple of slides i will explain more of belmont report okay so these are the four pillars of ethics and research when we talk about because as today main focus is on research and ethical practices because nowadays what you are seeing even in covid time what we had seen even though we are around 50 70 years ahead of these all guidelines everything but still we can see unethical practices okay publication on ethics you can say misconduct we are still seeing all those things so to understand the whole topic in a better way let's discuss about four different the first one is ethics then we have ethics committee we have institutional ethics committee and institutional review boards so ethics is basically it's a moral principle governing personal person's behavior and conduct of an activity so basically ethics is mainly which is coming from your own side inside okay you are the one who are going to determine whether it is ethically correct or not because somewhere or the other inside your heart you will be knowing it whether it is ethically correct or ethically not but due to some circumstances only only people do unethical practices so that is has to be identified so when we do human research in a real time so these are the bodies institutional ethics committee or ethics committee so these are the committees which look after all these practices so that no one should do wrong and the patient right safety and well being is protected please note these three keyword the patient right the patient safety and well being is protected so iec is nothing but it's a board constituted by institution to review document submitted for clinical trial and provide opinion on research projects involving human subjects so basically this committee will be there in your colleges or in your hospitals wherever you are doing research or it may be at the national or the central level also so basically they are the one which will be approving your protocols research protocols and the main focus of this committee is the patient right safety and well being is not altered so the other part is ethics committee so it's an independent body constituted by medical scientific and non scientific members responsible for ensuring right safety and well being of all the trial participants so basically in ethics committee there will be a representation from all corners of the society so for example as per indian government that is icmr minimum 5 to 7 members i will say in india as per schedule y and as per icmr minimum 7 members should be there and as per ich guidelines there should be minimum 5 members and the representation of members is like it should be having a medical expert it should have a non medical expert or non scientific expert it may be a layman and it may be having a representation from the law or the legal side okay or it should be an equal representation from the women 
that is the gender equality should be there gender representations should be there and any other person okay who fits into this committee can be a member of that and not only that even the external expert for example if i'm doing an oncology trial so in this committee i can invite a onco specialist to look after the protocol so ethics committee is the most important committee in science so the young researchers if you had done any research you must have gone through your ethics committee so every ethics committee in india few years back there was no level. maybe at the local level it was required but few years back the cdsc the government of india has made it mandatory that all the ethics committee or institutional ethics committee whichever are there either in the colleges or either in the hospital should get themselves register at the central level also so as to keep check and balances and to make sure that all the procedures are followed properly then you have irb institutional review board which actually review all the documents on a regular basis so the core principles of ethics committee of all this belmet report and all this they are divided into four one is principle of beneficence that is do good non maleficence that is do not harm justice refers to fairness and autonomy that is controlled by the individuals so let's study one by one non maleficence that is do not kill do not cause pain or suffering and do not incapacitate or do not cause offense to anyone out there principle of beneficence protect and defend the right of others prevent harm from occurring to others remove condition that will cause harm help person with disabilities rescue person in danger principle of autonomy it refers to tell the truth to the patient do not hide anything that's very very important respect the privacy of others protect confidentiality information and obtain consent for intervention with the patient autonomy nowadays in india specifically we talk not only in india globally as we know that we are living in an era of social media digital era we are all going through a digital era where the information is the key to you can say everything and information is very easily and cheaply available in the market your privacy data your confidential data can be sold by anyone to anyone out there so government of india has made it mandatory that privacy and confidentiality should be maintained and no one should be targeted or your information personal health records should not get leaked out there because sometimes there are some diseases for example if you talk about cancer or if you talk about hiv or if you talk about tuberculosis or any other sexually transmitted or any disease which are having a taboo behind it so no sometime you may not be willing to share your medical information with any other person but if your privacy and confidentiality is leaked okay you may not be in a comfortable position so this is very very important and i think in india if you see the last few weeks news there is actually a you can say a law which is being proposed in the court means in the parliament on the privacy and confidentiality acts in india how it can be prevented and protected then you have principle of justice each person equal share so everyone should get an equal opportunity in the research participation and also to have benefits out of the research and i think the principle of justice each person as an equal share during the time of pandemic we as a individual as a country and if we see from a global perspective there was a lot of challenge which had happened when it comes to the accessibility of vaccines to the larger part or the larger community can anyone can tell me what challenges when we talk about justice or equal share to everyone out there what challenge we face during covid time and how this principle even now that's what i told even now these principles sometime or the other are being affected anyone how many of you agree on this that if we talk about the world as a one community the whole world as one do you think that everyone in the world has an equal opportunity for vaccination access yes or no anyone can give me an answer do you think that everyone out there has an equal opportunity for vaccine access 
Okay, uh, someone no, has. Sir. Okay, no, yes. Okay, so someone from the chat also had told perfectly right, because we can see the poorest of poor country were not having access to the vaccination, even after two years. There are some countries, there are people in the world, which had not had any access to the vaccinations, even now till now. There are countries, including India, including different other countries in the world, especially developed countries. When you talk about the West countries, which have resources, which have manpower, which have money power, in those countries, maybe the third round of vaccination, or even sometimes I'm hearing the fourth round of vaccinations are going on. So on one part of the world, you have community which are getting their fourth vaccination or third vaccination, and on the other side, at the world scale, large scale level, there are countries who had not got even a single vaccinations. The people are still struggling to get their first vaccinations done. So the principle of justice, that's what the WHO, which you can see, is trying their level best to get the vaccination access to the poorest of poor country so that they can deaths can be prevented. So each person should get an equal share to each person according to the needs they should get to each person according to effort to each person according to contribution and also merit. And during the time of COVID-19 vaccination drive, you had seen that the person who were given the vaccination first, they were the vulnerable groups. They were the healthcare workers. They were the elderly patients in which the chance of mortality was very high. The chance of infection, the chance of getting the virus was very high. So they were actually selected based on the principle of justice. Who should be given first? Who should not be given the vaccination in the first chance? Then there is another community during, because COVID has given us a very good learning when it comes to the research. That's what I told. The science is ever changing. Every day we are learning new. And from your own surroundings, you can learn these ethical principles. Some of other ethical principles I will tell. Especially, can you tell me which was the last group which was offered vaccination? Can you, anyone of you can tell me which was the last group which was offered vaccination? And can you give me a reason why they were offered the last? Anyone? Anyone can give me an answer? Which is the last? Immunocompromised? <laughs> like okay. immunodeficiency patients? Okay, immunocompromised patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, Any, anything, anyone else? Like both two doses they start for them. Okay, fine. Any, anything else? I think, the kids, I think the kids below 18 years since because they are like, uh, for those, uh, for elder people, for those who have to go to office and all, they gave first and for adults and all. But for um, children, they gave at last because um, for children, they are still in school. So that time during the COVID time, all the schools and colleges are closed, maybe because okay. of that. Okay, perfectly right. So one thing is for sure, which we agree, that majority says that the children were the one which were actually offered the vaccination in the last. There were few reasons behind that. That's where the principle of justice, when to give and when not to give. As you know, when we talk about risk and benefit, okay, first of all, the risk and benefit comes from the virus itself. That whether the virus is causing high mortality in the children or not. And as we know now, after two years and during the course of the virus evolution, how it was evolving from month to month, uh, the data was updating, we came to know that the children are actually the one group which is not affected by the virus that strongly. The mortalities were not reported in children. And even if the virus hits kids, the severity is less. So one thing we came to know that after a few days or a few months of outbreak, the children are less vulnerable to the virus because of the physiology or pathophysiology of the virus, what it is. So one thing is that the second aspect, if we see that kids which were in age group of around, you can say 16 or 18 or 12 to 16 or 8 to 12 and then below, there was a systematically the age group was opened up because when we do research in children's, what principle of justice says, if you want to include kids, first of all, we have to make sure that this vaccination should be used in children. Then only we can include children. And as we know, yes, definitely the kids require vaccination. So when we include children, first the higher age group of kids should be included in the research. That is why the government, when they had opened up, and once you prove that 
the drug is safe in the elderly child then we will go step by step down that is how it has been opened up for the kids so that is where the principle of justice by looking at the risk and the benefit by looking at the evidence based medicine or evidence which are being coming out in the market this is how it all begins now after the covid we can see that the monkey pox virus and actually now it is trending yesterday only i was seeing that around 25000 cases has already been reported how many of you know this anyone is following monkey pox outbreak very closely anyone have any idea so this is where the research comes because what a virus outbreak what a pandemic what a new what type of ethical challenges they will bring in because during this covid time other type of challenges when we talk about research what we has faced is i still remember there was a ethical challenge in research in some part of europe especially where in the first wave when the there was an acute shortage of beds in hospitals and ventilators there were physician who came and they actually made some sops on that some principles on that for example if there are 100 patients in the hospital okay and which require ventilation and the hospital is having only 50 ventilators so number of patient who require ventilator is 100 but your facility is having only 50 ventilators so what is your ethical challenge as a hospital as a researcher as a doctor to whom you will offer ventilator and whom you will left out can you tell me anyone came across this ethical challenge of research and which group was actually not preferred for this anyone anyone has gone through this ethical challenges in treatment when you are facing this situation to whom to give life saving ventilator i think in india also we had seen in the phase 2 or the wave 2 we had seen that we also faced this challenge anyone if you are the one who has to take a call on this how you will take a call which one which type of patients you will give opportunity to get ventilators anyone sir more uh, vulnerable uh, and uh, immunocompromised uh, patients okay so you will give an opportunity to immunocompromised and more vulnerable patient okay perfectly right any other group if you have an opportunity okay you have two groups one is a patient above 60 and a patient below 60 which one you will offer if you have to survive and you are not sure and there is a like possibility that both will die so which one you will say if you have this opportunity above 60 or below 60 sir most of the comorbid uh, conditions if uh, the patient has uh, many uh, uh, risk factors and uh, many diseases along with yes. the current uh, disease okay so you will save that patient which is having multiple comorbid conditions right yes, that's sir. what you want to tell okay but actually it uh, is less than 60 i think no because as that uh, below 60 sir below 60 okay. sir like mental okay. of the human beings nature of the human beings we'll try to say who will be lead more yes okay yeah. yes live more okay yeah, so yeah. that is that is where the ethical dilemma come we call them as ethical dilemmas so there was this actually this challenge actually arised for many governments out there and what decision they took was in many parts of the world because please note both are actually we have to save everyone that is the first principle but when this situation arises and we are helpless so the decision was taken that the people who are having more opportunity to live and better chance to survive the ventilator should be given to them for example one of my friend over here just told if someone is having multiple comorbid conditions okay should be given an opportunity for ventilator but on the other side if someone is having multiple comorbid condition the ch chance of survival is less that's first aspect the second aspect if someone is above 60 the person has already lived a good part of his life and if you have a decision to take to save a person with a 40 year age and someone with 60 year age from a regulatory point of view the regulators will say okay i will go and say for a person with age 
because my chance of survival my chance of success will be much more higher for 40 and as a country a person with age 40 will be more productive for me when compared to a person with age 60 now you are understanding when we talk about ethical principles sometimes the challenge may come at individual levels but sometimes the regulator challenges will also come uh, is it fine now this type of ethical challenges which we are talking because virus was do you think that these ethical challenges can actually manipulate the policies also sometime i will give you one example i think most of us will be knowing that there is a patent law in india which governs the drugs and also the pricing of the drug as all we know when the drug is in patent it will be very costly for example there was a molecule which was actually used for hepatitis c and that particular molecule and that is a single molecule only which is available in the whole world that is actually sold for one dollar one thousand dollar a pill in us so we will very commonly used to tell it as a thousand dollar pill used for treatment of hepatitis c and a patient may require a total 15 days of therapy with that pill and the total cost runs in lakhs of lakhs of dollars and for a common man for us, you can say lower middle income group or for a middle income group, it becomes unaffordable. Maybe a majority, maybe 80% of the world or 90% of the world, it is unaffordable. Maybe only 5 or 10% of the world can afford that much costly treatment. And in India also, as we know, there are thousands and thousands of patients with hepatitis C. So there is an ethical challenge now because government of India is bound for patent protection law. But under special circumstances, it can be challenged and a waiver can be taken in court of law. So the Supreme Court of India, under these type of exceptional scenarios, when there is a question to save lives, to help masses, the government actually can direct, the courts can direct the governments to change the law or give an exception waiver for a particular cause. And for this particular cause, actually the waiver was taken and the company was forced to collaborate with an Indian partner and that same thousand dollar pill was actually sold in India for less than twenty dollars, so as to make it affordable and available to masses in India. So that is where the principles, the regulators, the you can say judiciary, do play a role from time to time. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other principles of Belmont Report and other principles governing the whole medical research. So principle of essentiality, the principle of voluntariness, that is voluntarily participation. The principle of non-exploitation, we should not exploit anyone out there. The principle of social responsibility, okay, because whatever we do, whatever we are doing, it should actually help and support the society. And the principle of ensuring the privacy and the confidentiality, the principle of risk minimization, please note, very, very important. Whatever we do, we have to make sure that whatever the risk is there, it should always be minimized. We should not make our patients unduly at high risk. Okay, so principle of risk minimization, very important. Then we have principle of professional competence, another very important part. The principle of maximization of benefits, principle of institutional arrangements, principle of transparency and accountability, the principle of totality of responsibility. The responsibility should be defined for every individual out there. And the principle of environmental protection, nowadays, very important. I don't know how many of you are aware, but there is a new concept which is now coming out from the global stage that is sustainable development goal, SDP goals, sustainable development goals. So the world has set goals for academic institutes, for schools, for colleges, for, for everyone. Out there. Okay. So the United Nations UNDCP program, it is called. So environmental protection is one of the main objective of sustainable development goal. So all the clinical trials, all the research, whatever we are doing nowadays, actually it should have somewhere or the other linked with sustainable development goal. In case if you are not aware, you can actually go and search about United Nations sustainable development goal. And maybe in your colleges, in your research institutes, maybe in your companies, they may be working on SDP goals. So these were some of the principles. Okay, so this is another presentation of that. So it is all same. I will now just go through. So these are some of the governing bodies all over the world, which actually governs 
uh, ethical practices for research. So we have Office of Human Research Protection, OHRP, under Department of uh, Health and Human Services in US. Then we have Canadian Association of Research Ethics Board, those who are interested in going abroad. These are some of the bodies. In UK, we have NHS, Health Research Authority, HRA, under National Health Services. Under European, we have European Network of Research Ethics Committee. Then in Australia, we have Human Research Ethics uh, Committee, HREC, under National Health and Medical Research Council. And in India, the governing body in the council is ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. I will be showing you the ICMR website also after my presentation. And uh, mainly ICMR, as we are in India, it's an epic body of India which formulates, coordinates, and promote biomedical research. And it is one of the oldest and largest medical research bodies in India. And it's standard for ethics in biomedical and health research involving human participants. And okay, give me a minute. I will just open and I will just show you the website. Give me a second. I will just show you the ICMR latest guidelines so that after my lecture, whoever is interested, they can actually visit and see that websites. Give me a second. I'm opening. Any questions, uh, anyone? Till now, anyone have any questions? I will be happy to answer. Anyone have any questions? No, sir. Okay. So it is just opening, give me one second. So for those who are new to this area, this is the website of ICMR. And in this website, you can see there are different opportunities as a researcher to understand the ethical guidelines in a better way. And especially COVID, this website was very, very active. In routine days or in routine years, maybe after one or two years or maybe after three years, the guidance used to get updated. But during COVID time, ICMR was updating their guidelines, their recommendations on Maybe you can say every two, three months, but sometimes every week also, they were updating their guidelines. So it's a very, very important website for all the researchers because you get all from that you can see in this website, I will be sharing the link also in the chat box. Over here, you can see National Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical and Health Research Involving Human Participants, 2017 guideline. So this is a very important guideline for human research to be conducted in India. So whatever I'm teaching today, actually all the basis will be given in ICMR 2017 guideline also. Okay. Then there are other guidelines, the previous guideline, like national ethical guidelines for biomedical research in children's. Then you have format for suggestion of committee ethic review for multidisciplinary research, draft of ICMR guidelines for common ethical review of multi-center research. So all this thing as a researcher, and maybe who knows, maybe someday you may be a part of ethics committee. So you may be requiring these links for better understanding. So maybe you can go and explore these links whenever you get time. I will just share in your chat box. Give me a second. I'm just sharing the chat. Okay, I had shared the link in the chat box. So those who are interested, they can actually go and see that. Just give me a second. Let me go back to my slides.
Just give me a minute. Okay, uh, so this is the timeline for ICMR updates. So you can see in 2020, National Guidelines for Ethics Committee reviewing biomedical health research during COVID-19. So they had given the guidelines in 2020. And in 2017, that is a landmark guidelines had already been issued by ICMR for ethics and human research. So these are some of the journal ethical issues which we had already discussed like benefit risk assessments, informed consent, privacy and confidentiality, justice and Sicily clears, payment for participation, compensation for research related harms, selection of vulnerable special groups as research participants, post-research access and community engagements. Please note, payment of research participants is a very big challenge. As we know, there are a lot of ethical issues concerning payment for participations. So in 2019 guidelines, previously in India, India was actually one of the among the, I will say, the countries in which any clinical trial related injury, if it happens in India, one of the lowest level of compensation used to be given few years back. But in 2019, when the new clinical trial guidelines was launched by government of India, so there is a proper formula which is available now for any clinical trial related injury and how the payment has to be made to the participant also has been clearly defined. Because many a times, even if a participant is eligible for getting benefits, so that benefit may never reach the patient himself. So in that way, the guidelines are very clear now. At the end of my lecture, I will share that guidelines also with you. That is a 2019 guidelines. So payment of to the research participants, another very important criteria. So over here, you can see some of the basic other principles like benefit occurring from the research should be made accessible to individuals, community and population whenever relevant. Community may be given benefit in an indirect way by improving living conditions, establishing counseling centers, clinics or schools and also the benefit to the individual community should be maximized and risk should be minimized. Social and scientific value should justify the risk. An ethics committee actually takes care of all. The other part, I think someone's mic is on. Okay, just give me a minute. Okay. Chetan, I request you to kindly mute. Chetan, mic is on. Uh, can you please uh, mute your mic, guys? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So community engagement uh, also is very important and informed consent, as we had discussed in my previous few topics, informed consent is very, very important. Please note, as a young researcher, informed consent plays a very, very important role. So whatever patient you are involving in your research, you have to make sure that you are actually telling your patients properly through the set guidelines, which are being set by your institutional ethics committee and make sure that you are taking consent of your participant. Because for example, if there is an audit and you had not taken the consent, you had not taken the signature of the participant voluntarily participation, you may be blacklisted as a researcher from the science community itself. The whole clinical trial can be stopped if the patient rights and safety is not taken care and consent is not properly taken. And always remember the vulnerable groups. Vulnerable groups, I will tell you what are the different type of vulnerable groups. One is children. Then you have pregnant women. You have ethnic minority groups. You can say the war prisoners, the prisoners who, which are living in jails or somewhere, orphanage, okay, in which the kids are living, elderly homes, old age homes. So all these populations become vulnerable. Not only that, even if you are working in a healthcare setting or in, in an institute where the trial is going on, you are also vulnerable. And if you are doing an academic clinical trials, for example, if you are a teacher, okay, and you want to do some trials on your school children, okay, or on your students, your students become vulnerable. Because always remember a vulnerable group, because if their participation decision is altered, or it can be manipulated in any manner, they become vulnerable in nature. So vulnerable group uh, protection is very, very important. So these participants should only include in the research, only when the research directly answer the health requirement of the group. That's what I told why the children who were taken in the vaccination. First of all, we have to make sure that the vaccination should be used for children. If that justified, then only the children should be 
included in the research same thing applies to the drug research for example if my drug is actually meant to be used for pregnant women then only the pregnant women should be included in the trials otherwise no okay so that is very very important you have to justify the use of vulnerable groups and participant who suffer any harm or any injury they should be actually compensated okay or any death occurred because of that and participant are offered free medical care for non research related conditions okay and protect individual autonomy to freely choose whether or not to participate always remember patient comes first whenever i teach my students i always tell the patient comes always first and if a patient decide not to continue in the research or not to participate further in the research he has all the rights to withdraw himself at any given point of time you cannot force him you can actually take a justified reason from him that why he don't want to continue but we cannot force him to continue please note that so that is very very important so patient has all the right from any given point of time and the researcher should safeguard their confidentiality as already told and the participant may be reimbursed for expense occurred all those things is there so just i will go quickly in that i think we are on the midway okay because i have to cover the different research designs also so the responsibility conduct of research another very important point that is use of unprivileged and vulnerable group at participants post trial access to the research benefits all should be there post access to the research trial means for example if someone get a injury in the clinical trials for example if there is a long term side effect the person is participating in the trial and i think during covid time when the vaccines were just launched and i think there was a very popular case in the internet which has actually come up uh, i think for uh, bharat serum if i am not wrong there was a person who has actually encounter a serious side effect which he has quoted that uh, maybe encephalitis which he has come across and he has blamed that after taking a vaccination he had come across that and the company has actually back filed a lawsuit against the patient that for giving misinformation and misleading information but do look for these type of case reports because sometime what happen is because now after 2 years in the journey of vaccine safeties and all we are seeing that the vaccination or the covid related side effects or the vaccination long term related side effects are actually coming out in the market so it is your responsibility as a researcher especially who are involved in that that the post trial access the post occurrence that once you had given the vaccines or the drug what happened next whether after few months or after few years whether the person is having any ill effects or not and if it is linked with your drug or a vaccine the patient should be compensated for the same then you have institution must establish policies that protect human participation and responsible data handling and proper storage and protection should be there and the research that is completed irrespective of the results this is very very important as a researcher whenever we complete a study and whenever we write results in our research you can say thesis or when we publish a research article we always focus on positive results and not only on positive results and positive associations also but we always forget that the negative results are also equally important when we compare positive results but our mind setup is in such a way that we only focus on the positive results because if someone is carrying out a research and if you had failed 100 times and if you publish it you are actually helping others and telling him okay these are the 100 ways if you follow this you can fail in the research so the negative results also sometimes becomes very very important for us as a researcher as an individual to know what went wrong and to learn from the previous experience so vulnerability already we had talked i will not go in that detail so risk for the women and children they should only be involved whenever there is a need for them then you have clinical trials of drugs and other interventions regularly there is a body in india called as ctri i don't know how many of you know it so ctri is nothing but it is called as clinical trial registry of india and all the clinical trials must be registered with ctri for example if i am a new researcher so what is my first step towards identifying the core area where the research are going so what i will do is for example if i want to do research in cancer 
and i want to find out okay how many type of different type of cancer research are going in my country so I, what i will do is i will go to ctri website and i will search for any clinical trial which is registered under ctri in cancer domain and then what are the results when they come up i will come to know that okay in so and so institute in so and so hospital and also i will get the researcher detail who is carrying out the research so this type of data can help me collaborate with them so this is very important another type of you can say organizations we had already talked declaration of helsinki you have drug and cosmetic act okay i i don't know how many of you are aware anyone is aware what is the update on drug so drug and cosmetic act was not in india in 1940 and became impossible and we used to have some men out in two thousands this time i'm going to the where we had stopped give me a second okay i uh, we stopped from here uh what i was telling there is i think ctri part was everyone is ctri okay i will just repeat so ctri is one of the website from where i can get my latest research information or clinical trials whether it is an academic or institutional clinical trials they are get actually getting register with ctri that is clinical trial registry of india so for example as a researcher if i am doing a research on cancer and i want to look at okay in india which all institutes are involved in cancer research and which all researchers are involved in cancer research so what i will do is i will go to ctri i will give a quick search and i will be able to find out what type of cancer research are going on which institutions are involved which type of researchers or investigators are involved so i can get information on from ctri same way if i want to go globally then there is a website called as clinicaltrial.gov i will be sharing showing you this websites maybe in later half so these are the websites clinicaltrial.gov gives you clinical trial information which is registered with them from around is all over the world then there is another very important document drug and cosmetic act rule of 1940 for all of you this document was launched by government of india in 1940 became rule in 1945 and this document is regularly updated by government of india there are regular amendments but now government of india in last 2 3 months there is a draft newer draft which is now available so how we know drug and cosmetic acts since many years it may change totally okay in coming you can say few months or maybe next couple of one or two years the whole drug and cosmetic act will be revised and updated again okay so that's a very important event which is going to come so we are following it very closely and also social and behavioral science for health should be taken care of. and informed consent as i already told the patient rights are always very important so based on principle of ethics individual has the right to truly uh, right to choose freely whether or not to participate in the research he has all the rights to withdraw from the research at any given point of time he has the right to get all the compensation he has the right to be offered all the latest therapies which are available and sometime when the newer therapies are available you may require a reconsent from the patient okay that you had explained the new updated updates in the field where in which the clinical trial is going on and the patient has understood and you need a reconsent so that is also sometime possible and also the public health research especially when we talk about covid so the ethics in public health applies to both practice and research to ensure better societal condition and healthier lives so many times government use special powers for carrying out public health research for diseases of national importance and as we had seen in time of covid and now we are seeing in time of monkeypox 
and other outbreaks can anyone can tell any other disease which you know which is of national importance which can become pandemic in future any other disease which you know apart from monkeypox and covid 19 any other virus which you know and actually there was a very small outbreak in india for that virus which was actually contained very very effectively by both state and central government anyone you can unmute yourself if you want to tell which is the virus which we are talking about which could have been a potential another which can result in another pandemic anyone heard about nifa virus anybody heard about nifa virus so there was a small outbreak of nifa virus in kerala uh, maybe last year but with the efforts of state government and the central government both the alertness by the regulators and the health authority the virus was contained at a very very small area itself and uh, the virus was eliminated the strict measures were taken but the nifa virus itself has the potential to cause another pandemic and same way in some part of africa there was another uh, pandemic not pandemic i will say uh, the virus ebola virus was spread at the local level so ethical and human challenges in research as we are going further and as the environmental changes are happening and new research genetic research are coming like human genetic testing and research the newer ethical challenges do come when we are dealing so genetic manipulations gene editing changes all these changes can become lot of ethical challenges for future research then biomaterials biobanking and data sets like stem cell research stem cell databases okay gene editing therapies medical technologies assessments all will become further ethical challenges and research during humanitarian and emergencies and disasters okay like especially in war hit countries how the research is going on how the humanitarian crisis are going on and research in these vulnerable areas another very big challenges to be carried out so while there may be a need to undertake research quickly this should not impact scientific validity and the need to upload ethical requirements so as a researcher you have to keep in mind all these issues while planning and designing your research so designing innovative relevant research based on rapid evolving certainties which is expected to yield scientifically valid results another very important challenge so okay so that's all for research i think a lot of thing has been told and now we will be shifting to some of the new market trends and then i will take up my ethical study designs the research study designs i will be taking okay till now anyone have any questions we are on the half part anyone have any questions anyone till now okay so before I'm we sorry, go so, and... hello yes yes please tell sir my question is if we uh, do not include a uh, uh, special like uh, pediatric patient like pediatrics and uh, this pregnant females in the research then how on what uh, basis we conclude that this drug is uh, like effective or not for the future okay uh, so like now on what basis we... yes sir yes. it is not included that this drug is not yes. to be given for the pregnant women or okay so first of all that there na uh, for uh, yes, yes, yes. drugs yes sir yes exactly okay so very important thing to understand is when we include small children or pregnant women because as we know that pregnant women they are all vulnerable kids are vulnerable they have a total different ADME properties okay yes. then when compared to a normal adult and the chance of getting side effects is also very high in these vulnerable groups right so what happen is until unless we are giving a proof or we are justifying our need of doing trials in kids for example if i'm working on a drug xyz drug and i have to prove that this drug can be used in children if i give a justification that this drug can have an application in kids then only i can include children in my clinical trial and that too if i'm including children first the thing is i have to include elderly kids like higher age group and then i have to go down the ladder by including other age groups but only after justifying that my drug is actually being used by the kids like for example in covid 19 vaccine because there was a need 
of this vaccination to be given to the children yes, but sir. as we know the children are not at immediate risk of deaths or high mortality so first the scientists and the governments what they did was they waited for the safety and efficacy results from the adult population and once they are sure that the vaccines are safe enough then only they given the approval for doing clinical trials in elderly kids please note there were actually two vaccinations one was initially covid shield which was launched and then we have covaxin bharat COVID. vaccine yes sir. yes so covid shield even though it was launched early was not given approval for usage in kids are you aware of it yes the sir approval, the approval was not given because there were few reports from the west like in some parts of the europe the vaccine had shown some sort of side effects or higher risk of cardiovascular events in younger adults and younger kids so that's why the covid shield had not got the approval initially instead covaxin has got initial approval for usage in children now you understand so yes sir the only thing we have to remember is when we are using vulnerable group the researcher or the sponsor or the investigator they have to justify the need of the group in the research it's not like we can exclude them it's not like that only thing is we have to justify okay. that's all okay sir okay yes anyone else sir i think i have uh, other than this question but near to same one there is a yes. two things for that pd especially uh, yes. first thing is content ticket okay yes second yes. one is called medical uh, safety not stabilized i'm confusing these two words it is related to that uh okay so you are telling one is contraindicated yeah we know contraindicated okay like some vaccine we say contraindicated another yes, one is saying leaflet is saying safety and efficacy not stabilized so in that which one we can use as pd yeah okay for example sometime what happen is there are some special group of individuals for example okay. in which vaccine may be contraindicated okay okay for for example if there is a immunocompromised patient okay okay as we had seen in covid time and a person who are taking immunocompromised drugs like steroids okay or there are individual who had a past history of side effect or allergic reaction like for oh. example anaphylaxis reactions yeah okay so for example in your childhood if a if a kid has taken any vaccination and he had come across body rashes mm. or high grade fevers which may had landed him in a hospitalization a life threatening adverse drug reaction or anaphylactic reaction so in those conditions or a person is having a compromised liver or a kidney are you getting my point so, yeah, yeah, yeah so depend on the risk identifying the vaccine can be contraindicated in those group not only okay. contraindicated and in case if the physician wants to give it has to be given under supervision of a doctor okay so that's so yeah i mean so, yeah, so i then got it yes yeah, yeah so what they will do is they will use a test dose first instead of giving a full fledged yeah, dose full dose test dose atd yes a test dose will be given in order to check any allergic reactions or any allergic response like how Thank we do you. for our normal drugs yeah atd okay? yeah atd yeah then then the other part which you had asked was the safety and is not Epi established then yeah. i think in the covid let's talk about the covid vaccine itself okay. because this vaccine normally if you take example of a drug or any normal vaccine it takes around you can say 8 to 10 years of different phases of clinical trials to launch in the market it start with a drug discovery for one one and a half year maybe pre clinical trials another one one and a half year then phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 and phase 4 all this process takes around 8 to 10 years minimum for any drug to come in the market to make sure the drug are safe and effective but when we talk about covid vaccine launch because it was under emergency approval process so yeah fast track approval so there is a provision in the in the law in the regulatory bodies to fast track everything because of national importance okay of global emergence so what regulatory bodies will do is even with the small evidence of safety and efficacy the regulatory bodies will give approval but that doesn't mean that the company will like take hands from the responsibility it's not like that even though the approvals are given 
the companies are bound to continue the safety and efficacy studies for longer duration of time. Yeah, and, in and, simple, sir, we can say like that uh, risk benefit ratio. That's why they start yes, that one. But yes, the remaining thing will continue. Remaining yes, thing will continue thing, our like that, that will get the final result. Yes, perfectly right. And I think yeah, because and because of this, there was a time I still remember in March 2021. Yeah. After exactly one year of launch of Covid Shield, after all, I think almost six months of launch, there was a time when Europe has actually banned temporarily. There was a halt on. Covi shield for some time, for maybe one or two months, if you remember. Yeah, so there's, there's a uh, circulation for that. Yes, because of unwanted case reports which has come in the market. That's what my next topic is: case reports and case series. So I okay, so we start from there. Yeah, we'll uh, yeah. remain uh, remain time. We'll personally message you. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So okay. before I go further, I will just quickly give an overview of the industry and different type of trial design we use. So these are the global figures for global clinical trial market. So the industry as a whole is about to increase from 41 billion to 60 billion dollar. And these are some of the statistics. USD 44 billion in 2020 to 47 billion. So that is the growth rate. And global clinical trial market is bound to increase. And America actually have a very large share of all global clinical trials. Around 51% of the share is with America. And the key players are IQVIA, Perexel, Pharmaceutical, LL Charles, Rivers. Icon, Pfizer, and many other players are there. And over here, you can see adoption of new technologies in clinical trials are changing very fast. And the phase three clinical trial dominance market for clinical trials accounting for largest share of 53.2% in 2020. And interventional study designs are accounting for 80% of the share. An oncology segment of the global clinical trial because Many a time as a researcher, the question comes is which field we should choose for our research. So we can see over here, the global clinical trial segment, oncology, that is a cancer research. It accounts for almost 36% of the whole chain of research. So these are the various phases of clinical trial in which various molecules are there. So we can see the phase three molecules dominates the market at present. And let's go further. And this is in India all the phase one, two, three molecules are being distributed. And these are the projections for up to 2025. And in India also, these are the market share of global clinical trial. So this is the first thing as a researcher, uh, in case if you want to choose your field for future for doing PhDs, or if you're looking for your industrial career, these are the areas you have to go with the market trend because this is the first step where there is a demand, where there is money, you have to go and choose those fields. And also depend on your interest. So we have autoimmune, you have pain, oncology, CNS, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular. So these dominates the global chain of clinical trials. And definitely now there is a new, which has been added because it is 2020 data, which has been collected. Now the virus research, the vaccine research has been added to this. And these are the Indian trends. You can see in India, the observational clinical trials were dominating, followed by interventional trials. And then you have expanded access trials, which are there. And these are the reports, global reports, which I will be sharing with you. You can go through it. These are the datas. Okay. These are the from India. The market size is around $2 billion, 2025, around $3 billion growth rate of around 8.7%. So India is on the right track of the projection. Now let's talk about some of the ethical uh, concerns, which do come across. I will not spend much time on this, maybe around 10 minutes on this. So there is a big challenge of scientific misconduct, authorship challenges, conflict of interest and mentorships. So scientific misconduct includes fabrication of data for Let's discuss with some of the examples. This is one of the very landmark uh, scientific misconduct uh, study that has happened and it has been actually published in top most journals. So there was a controversy on use of colloids versus crystalloids for fluid resuscitations. So over here, the Mr. Bolt has published around 95 papers directly or indirectly linked with benefits of colloids. And you will be very surprised to know out of 95 papers, 
94 papers were retracted and the person actually has to resign from his post for scientific misconduct, which may have promoted the use of colloid despite the harms linked with it. So this type of misconduct can happen. And then the failure of reproducibility. Nowadays, it's another very big challenge, especially in the academic institutes. When someone, your students are publishing the results, especially if you are doing any analytical results or experimental studies, if you are doing, reproducibility is very, very important. And many a times now, yesterday we had a meeting and we were having a meeting with some of the ethical uh, publishers, which publish journals. They were telling top end journals, they have a full-fledged team with them and they have a research collaboration with some big institutes. For example, if you send a paper to them, they will send the paper to that lab and they will replicate your results by giving what data you had given them. And they will tell whether the results are actually reproducible as claimed by the author in their papers. And based on that, they will either reject or they will accept. And in case if there is a violation of reproducibility and it is not, that researcher will be sent for clarification and even blacklisting of researchers can happen in case if falsification of data happens. So post hoc changes to enhance positive findings. Okay. Substantive changes in the protocol. And now even protocols, the companies or the publishers are asking for your protocols also. And even you can publish your protocols in different domains like clinicaltrial.gov or any other domains you can publish. Then as we all no, we publish literatures. So definition of authorships, very, very important. So authorships can be sometimes gifted authorships and sometimes it can be unethical practices which are being used in authorships. So there should be a substantial contribution to study designs, analysis or interpretation. Draft or revise the articles should be there and given the final approval, the trainee who created the figure, analyst to perform the analysis, scientific writers who draft the articles, investigator who enroll the patients. So these type of justification should be there in order to justify an author. So violation of authorships ethics is if there is a guest authors or ghost author, for example, ghost author means if someone has actually contributed in your article, like for example, if someone has actually contributed in writing it, making tables, figures or something, but he's not included as an author. So then he becomes a ghost author that is not ethically justified and also guest author. Okay. In case if someone has not contributed, so that guest authorships should be very carefully decided. Okay. Managing authorship issues, very, very important. So especially at the researcher levels, it has to be decided prior only so that there should be conflict of interest in the last, and it should include the mentee and the trainee. So all should get an equal representation. If someone has contributed to the research, then conflict of interest, the investigator main interest should be obtained valid research results and should not conflict or appear conflict financially or reputation. So conflict of interest statement, because those who are publishing the paper and not only that, even in clinical research, we have to declare our conflict of interest. That's very, very important. Okay. Because conflict of interest sometimes can cause bias in your research and managing conflict of interest, how you will manage by declaring your conflict that is funding agencies with journals or committees you are working with or managing conflict like another scientist acting as a PI. For example, if I am a ethics committee member, I give you a very common example. If I am an ethics committee member and I am the one actually who is a part of a team who is approving the protocol. Now, conflict of interest came. For example, if I am a PI also, if I am doing my own protocol, I had sent my protocol to my same ethics committee. Can I be a part of the team which will take a decision on the protocol? Because it's my own protocol. Can I take a decision on my own protocol? Is it ethically justified? Yes or no? Give me an answer. Anyone? No, sir. No. no right. no. Yeah. Yes. The answer no. Why it is no? Because I have a conflict of interest. So as a responsible individual, what I will do is I will tell my ethics committee, look, I have a conflict of interest because it, I am only the PI of this particular protocol. So I cannot participate in the decision-making process. So I am withdrawing my name from the decision-making process so that there should be no conflict of interest. Same way, if you are publishing a paper, okay. And you are publishing in a journal in which you yourself are an editor. So you have to declare the conflict of interest. Okay. So that's very, very important. Otherwise it will cause bias. So 
scientific misconducts the highest standard of scientific conduct should be always practiced and some concern covers by regulations but requires objectivity and personal responsibility and regulatory officials and colleagues should take equal responsibility so with this my first part of the lecture is over i think i had covered a lot many domains uh, i had touched a lot of different aspects of human research ethics different type of definitions because we can talk actually hours together for this and i will be coming now uh, shall we take a 5 minutes quick break is it okay with all or shall okay uh, so good evening all again uh so we will be starting with my second part of my topic i hope uh i had made clear to everyone like what is research and what are the different ethical issues what are the various historical landmark events and what futuristic research look like and some of the points we had discussed and some of the steps in research so now i will be discussing about the main topic that is our epidemiological research study designs as you know as a researcher many times it's a very important question for all of us what type of research study design we should opt for and what are the different designs sir, available first of all sir, hello sorry to interrupt ha huh, sir huh? did you share the screen uh okay yes i think so just see is can, it visible can anyone else see i cannot see it actually is it visible to everyone yes. sir only one screen not moving is coming pharmacopharmacology research study design bus yeah now it scans it's 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 visible okay. right yeah it's visible sir okay, okay. yeah okay. okay okay so when we talk about research study design so it's very important to understand the various type of designs available because always remember the planning phase of a research is the most important part of for any research for example if you are doing your master research or if you are doing your phd research or in case if you are planning to conduct a clinical trial so it's very important at the beginning itself your research study design should be appropriate otherwise what will happen once your protocols get approved you start your research and by the time as the time passes you think that your research study design is not appropriate you are not getting the results which you were planning to get so the whole study the whole time can get wasted and for a researcher time is very important so we should be able to understand what designs we are going to use so epidemiology and pharmacoepidemiology these are two different words but very very similar to each other so let's start with epidemiology what it is so if you consider epidemiology it is like among people study so studying of disease occurrence in human population is mainly referred to as epidemiology so it mainly focus on study of distribution and determinant of health related states or even in a specified population is referred to as epidemiology study now over here please note the study of disease occurrence in humans there is another word now pharma co epidemiology the word pharma is now added and if we understand the word pharma it means it reflect drugs so pharma co epidemiology study is it is a study of and the use of an effect of drugs in large number of population so the previous epidemiology was study of disease occurrence in a larger group of patient now pharmacopidemiology refers to as understanding the study the usage and the effect of drugs in a given number of patients or in a population so the field of pharmacopidemiology use the techniques of chronic disease epidemiology of study of use of an effect of drugs in a given population so a scientific method is a three stage process first of all selection of a group what study group you are going to focus on that's very very important what type of association and causation you are looking for so what type of relation you are looking for that's very important you have to define it so in the first stage one select a group of subject for the study now the first step which group of subjects you are going to select another very very important for example if you are working or doing research in a academic institute or in a hospital so for any study or any research to be conducted in humans one very important thing is to understand whether if i am for example if i want to do a study in for example lung cancer 
so what is my first step is first is i will go and select a hospital okay where i can go and where the lung cancer patients are coming so i will select a hospital where these type of patients are coming now i know that patients are coming in that particular hospital now in my study i want to see that for example as per the literature i am calculating my sample size at 200 lung patients but whether actually that number may be actually present in my hospital in next one year for example my total duration of study is one year and i want to recruit around 200 patient as per my sample size as per the literature is available but to check the feasibility or to check the group what i will do is i will go to the medical department record department of the hospital with the permission and what i will tell them is i will give them an icd coding so for every disease there is a icd code available and what i will tell them is okay can you give me a statistics of last 3 years how many patients for this particular type of cancer has come to the hospital so they will give me a rough number of the last 3 years so based on that number and what sample size i had calculated whether they matches or not so what i want to tell you is the feasibility of your study at the first step itself is very very important what type of study group for example in lung cancer itself there can be different staging of cancer stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 metastatic non metastatic lung cancer or different type of other classifications can be there and if i am looking at any sub group then even my sample size will still narrow down are you getting my point then for example if i want to design a study maybe an intervention study intervention means for example if i want to carry out okay pharmaceutical care in lung cancer patients i want to do an intervention counseling intervention so depend on your study design your study population and sub grouping your sample size will be calculated the second part of the thing is one use this information obtained in the sample of study subject to journalize and draw a conclusion about a population and journal and this conclusion is referred to as association for example if i want to correlate or associate whether the smoking is linked with lung cancer or not i am trying to make any association so that also we have to justify in our objectives and the third one is generalize again and drawing a conclusion that is scientific theory or causation can be linked with it we will be explaining all the steps in my coming slide the selection of study designs is very important and answer an appropriate research question that includes the objective and the purpose of the study is very very important that's why whenever you go and talk to your guides or whenever your student comes to you for any research the very first point is deciding the objective of the study how many primary objectives you have how many secondary objectives you have based on that your studies will be designed then appropriate research questions including information about exposures about outcomes and the population of interest all these are very very important just now i told you like smoking what type of exposure is there for a particular disease and are you looking for that are you going to link exposure with the outcomes that is very very important for example if a person is a smoker and after how many years do you want to see that he will develop cancer that is an outcome okay and which population is your interest group whether you are looking at boys whether you are looking at male gender or a female gender or both or you are looking at young people or you are looking at elderly people or you are looking at some of the comorbid conditions so what is your population you have to predefine it and this is only possible after a thorough literature search okay so for doing a literature search there is a step by step criteria which i will be touching that also in coming slides so literature search is very very important just keep in mind so nowadays as all of you know that literature is so much available in abundance there are thousands and thousands of journals available so how to select a particular journal how to select a particular study that you can rely on there are thousands and thousands of journal and many of them are actually not reliable or sometimes we can substandard journals or fake journals or journals with plagiarism or maybe some different type of groups are available so how you will make sure that whatever research studies you are quoting for your research is from an authentic journal which is having actually some advantage or value in the science or research so that is very important selection of a journal 
Then you have key elements for clearly stated objectives are keeping them smart. So this is a smart formula that is keeping your objectives specific, keeping your objectives in a measurable form, appropriate, realistic, and time bound. Time bound is a very important aspect. That means how much time you have to complete your study, because as you know, the science is so volatile, and every day the science is changing. What is true today may not be true tomorrow. During COVID time, we had already seen that the therapies recommendations, week on week basis, on month and month basis, the governments were updating. How they were updating? As soon as the newer evidence comes in the market, in the research journals. Okay, they were updating their guidelines. Okay, for example, if you started with the objective of a drug comparison in a given group, and if, for example, if you were doing a study on COVID in the beginning, and you had kept your total study duration of study of impact of, for example, ivermectin on COVID nineteen patient, total study duration is three years. Do you think it will be feasible? Because in a three year time, the whole scenario evidence has changed. but still there is a possibility if you want to see the long term effect okay but always remember when the regulatory bodies are issuing recommendations for example on day one there is a recommendation and there is a clinical trial which is already going on and the recommendation changes after few months so you may have to retake a consent from the patient okay depend on the safety aspect of a molecule so that becomes challenging time bound you have to finish your research within a given specific time frame and the nature of disease which you are working on for example if you are working on a disease which is very very popular very common for example diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease i may not worry about the sample size because i know the disease is available in abundance but if i want to do on a disease which is very rare okay or which is maybe one in million patient is available okay maybe neurodegenerative disease so my sample size my study duration all will differ okay so depend on the nature of disease which we are talking about and the type of exposure we are talking about whether we are talking about a small time exposure or we are talking about a long term exposure all these things will determine what will be your sample size what will be your study duration what will be your disease population what type of staging you are going to use all these things i will say this is the main table which is the heart of all the studies if you understand this table i think my 50% of the job is done in making you understand about the different type of study designs so over here you can see there are two different domains different type of study which are categorized one is called as observational studies and one is called as experimental studies under epidemiological study designs so the first question is did investigator assign the exposure if there is a exposure which is assigned it will categorize as under experimental group under experimental study whether your samples are randomly allocated to the treatment group and the test group if you are randomly allocating if yes it goes under randomized control trial if no it undergoes non randomized control trial now randomization is another very important field of research can anyone can tell what is the advantage of randomization and how we do it anyone have any idea how we do randomization anyone can tell anyone has done randomized trials because randomized controlled trials are the one which are carrying the highest weightage in the field of research for example if i have 10 papers with me 10 articles will be okay one is randomized controlled trial one is maybe case control trial one is cohort study cross sectional study case report case series systematic review or many other so out of all these studies the highest weightage is actually given to randomized control trial what is the reason for that anyone okay perfectly right okay someone has okay fe has given a answer randomized control trials help reduce bias perfectly right 100% right because bias is one thing which can actually manipulates your results so as a researcher as an institute as a sponsor my primary responsibility is that i should minimize my bias in my research that's very very important it can be done in a multiple ways for example randomized trial is one of the method by which we reduce the bias 
for example in olden days randomization used to be carried out for example if you take a coin you flip that coin there is a 50 50% chance that either a head will come or either a tail will come okay so if head comes patient will go in group a and if tail come patient goes in group b in olden days this is how it used to done but there is an uncertainty what if out of 10 patient eight goes in group a and two only goes in group b there is a possibility nowadays randomized control trial how they are done is they are done by using algorithms or computer generated softwares okay so that if i have 10 patients i have to randomly allocate five patients to group a and five patients to group b otherwise what will happen is for example if i am a physician if i have the uh, option to choose myself which one will grow in group a which one will go in group b so what i will do is if i am a physician i have a group of patient group a is my test group group b is my standard therapy which i have to give so i am in a favor of making sure that the test drug which is of my interest should pass so what i will do is when the patients are coming if i have the power to choose i will put all the good patients the patient with less severity the patient which tend to have better outcomes i will put all those patient in group 1 where my test molecule is there and patient with more severe disease patient with bad outcomes i will put in you can say group b so there is a chance of bias but when we are doing random allocation we don't know which one will go in group a and which one will go in group b so randomized control trial definitely help prevent bias any other method which can help us in reducing bias anyone can tell any other method apart from bias a randomized control trial any other method which can help reduce bias anyone anyone heard about blinding study single blind double blind triple blind study anyone yes yeah, sir we study little bit but not the practical not the practical aspect okay so blinding is another technique because many times when you read clinical research articles or articles published for clinical trials they start with it is a randomized controlled double blind trial you may come across this type of heading so what is blinding for example there are four categories one is unblinded unblinded means both patient and doctor that is the investigator both of them know which drug is given to which patient whether he is getting the test drug or the reference molecule both of them know patient also know investigator also know these are unblinded trials single blind trial means the patient will not know which drug is given to him either a or either b but investigator will be knowing that is single blind investigator knows whether patient is receiving group a or group b patient doesn't know in double blind trial both patient and investigator both of them doesn't know that is called as double blind when patient also don't know investigator also don't know then comes triple blind trials in triple blind studies they are actually very commonly used also in which even the person so patient also don't know investigator also don't know even the person who is evaluating the research results that is a statistician or the data evaluator also will be blinded he also doesn't know which one is group a which one is group b so all these techniques are actually used to prevent bias in the research so the first part of the group of the study design is randomized controlled trials okay and non randomized controlled trials under experimental study then comes observational study if there is no exposure which is you can say assigned to the group they come under observational study in observational study there are two aspects if you have a comparison group or if you don't have a comparison group if there is no comparison group it is called as descriptive study and if there is a comparison group it is called as analytical study under analytical study it is further subdivided into three aspects one is cross sectional study one is case control study one is cohort study depend on what direction the research is going if you see over here the cohort study cohort study is actually very long term study and it is referring to as the exposure come first and outcomes comes next 
it's a prospective study for example on day 1 the patient starts smoking cigarette and what you will do is you will follow the patients for another 10 years okay and to see after 5 years or 10 years how many patient develop lung cancer so you have an exposure with you okay you have an outcome with you so they are coming under cohort type of study designs if you see case control study design case control study design specifically you already have an outcome with you and you are going back and checking what type of exposure a patient may had so you are going back in the history and checking what exposure patient may have anyone can tell me when case control studies any example anyone can give me when they may be more relevant anyone anyone any example for example i give you one example of side effects for example if there is a drug take example of uh, you can say amoxicillin so amoxicillin induced steven johnson syndrome so amoxicillin many a times it's a very rare and life threatening outcome that it may lead to steven johnson syndrome now you want to design a study okay to find out what is the risk associated with amoxicillin and how many patients will land up in steven johnson syndrome so which type of study design you will opt for anyone which will be more easy case control study yes case control study so what is happening is if it is a rare of rare you can say outcome that is steven johnson syndrome associated with amoxicillin it's one of the very rare outcomes very rare side effect so what i will do is i will in my hospital for example if there are 10 patients who are admitted with steven johnson syndrome i will take all those 10 patient and i will go back and see what type of exposure they had for that particular risk factor and out of those 10 patient i will see how many had received amoxicillin then i will try to find some conclusions out of it so these type of study designs are very important i will go next this is the second most important slide over here you can see on the top hand side we have prevalence or incidence of outcomes on the left hand side we have drug exposure so there is one on one side you have top hand side you have prevalence or incidence on the left side we have drug exposure and if you see under drug exposure and prevalence if drug exposure is also not rare the prevalence or outcome is also not rare what type of study design we use cohort study design it can be a prospective it can be a retrospective so cohort study design can be used but if the outcome or incidence is rare and drug exposure is not rare that's what just now i give an example of penicillin penicillin drug exposure is not rare right amoxicillin exposure is not rare but outcome steven johnson syndrome the outcome is rare that means it is coming under case control study so prevalence or outcome is rare drug exposure is not rare then there are some type of, some time cohort in which outcome is not rare but drug exposure is rare that type of also can be a cohort study then in case if both outcome is rare and drug exposure is rare you can go for case cohort study okay case cohort means a rare drug you are going to follow for next one year or two year and going to find out what type of outcomes are there when it is a rare exposure so when it is rare and rare it is case cohort study mostly cohort studies are long term studies to make an easy for you i had divided all the study designs in detail which are available in the literatures which are available in the book so we have descriptive or observational study so over here you can see the descriptive study when there is no comparison group available under descriptive study under descriptive study you have case report you have case series you have ecological study you have cross sectional study so these are the four most important type of descriptive study and believe me during covid time these were the one actually which has helped the world to understand and to take leads when it comes to the drugs which are effective in covid when we were repurposing the drugs or when we were looking at the side effects linked with vaccines 
so for example if you talk about case reports okay let's go further i will discuss one by one and these are the analytical studies under analytical studies we have three different types we have observational study under observational you have case control you have cross sectional cohort studies hybrid studies and under hybrid you have nested control case cohort case crossover case time series and under interventional you have controlled clinical trials randomized trials n of trials simplified trials community trials but during my lecture we will be touching on the most important trial designs we are not touching the whole all the designs but most important study designs to begin with before i go further just understand an overview of observational descriptive observational study so descriptive observational study what they will do is they will give a pattern of disease occurrence in relation to variable person place and time so it gives you an understanding of a pattern of disease how it is spreading in a given area at a given place of time so they are descriptive data which we are collecting it is mostly an observing even you are observing it and also descriptive observational study can help generate hypothesis so they are actually hypothesis generating studies recognize a character a problem in a given population so you can it can help you generate hypothesis and it do not mere association this is the limitation of descriptive observational study that it doesn't mere any association rather it mainly use mere of frequency such as proportion rate risk and prevalence in order to conclude something so the use of descriptive studies it provides magnitude of the problem provide clue to disease etiology enable healthcare provider administrator to allocate resources to plan effective prevention education and programs and generate hypothesis so during the early days of covid-19 outbreaks descriptive studies were the one actually which help us understand the magnitude of covid-19 problem and it provides to the clue to the etiology that is how the virus spreads the initial data which was coming out from china so those researchers who were following these leads very closely they were able to understand in a better way that how these descriptive studies actually helped us so coming next is we have case report we have case series ecological studies and cross sectional studies so case report is the very first type of study which a researcher come across when something is very new and it has not been proven previously so case studies describe the characteristics of a single patient with a problem for example i give you very good example covi shield as we know now now many cases in the beginning has started coming and emerging covi shield link with you can say you can say multiple clots or sudden clots or sudden cardiac arrest there were few case reports which had started coming that after taking a vaccination there were some you can say multiple clot observations were there where a person has experienced heart attack or a stroke or some other side effects but they were very rare events but during a vaccination launch when the when the molecule is new in the market and lot of new patients are being exposed to it so these type of case reports starts coming in the market and when multiple case reports starts coming out that's where a signal generation first comes into picture so if you see the first signal of an adverse drug event is actually coming from case report so this is very very important and especially during the time of pandemic it became much more important to know case report and for the young gen, uh, young researcher if you have a student and if you yourself are a student and you are working in a hospital and going to the wards so these are the first article which you can actually when you are going in your wards if you are coming across a rare side effect or a rare disease disease outcome you can actually publish it as a case report so for me as an individual my first paper was in case report and lot of our students which are going very new to or they are very fresh in the wards they actually publish various case reports whenever they come across a rare events so it is a first indication for the use of drug for off label indication by regulator agencies and spontaneous reporting system such as medwatch fda safety information system or in india we have pvpi that is pharmacovigilance program of india so in india all these case reports whichever comes and linked with the drug and side effects are being reported to pvpi program that is pharmacovigilance program of india controlled by government of india under cdsco 
and ipc gaziabad we are having the headquarters for pvpi center so the use of case report is like record unusual medical occurrence and can give first clue in identification of new disease or adverse effect or fan exposure and only mean of surveillance for rare clinical events disadvantages it's not possible for valid statistical association since it is since it is based on single case report so you are actually not going to conclude anything it is just a signal for future research or future research designs to happen but when multiple case reports comes it becomes case series so for example in a same hospital now multiple cases has started coming for blood clots associated with covishield so for example if i am only reporting four or five cases it becomes a case series so case series describing the characteristics of group of patient with similar diagnosis collection of case report exposed to same group uh, drug in which same outcome is observed and phase 4 marketing post marketing surveillance aim to study these informations about the drug in a larger group of patients in case series characterize a drug certain drugs disease association so this is the first time when there is some sort of association which you can link with respect to the disease and the outcomes of it for example in case series if i have five patients which are having same outcome okay but it will give me an easy understanding for example average age group of the patients whether it is male or female or whether any specific comorbid condition is responsible for these type of adverse outcomes so that type of associations at kai start looking for and it do not includes a comparison group that's very very important we are not comparing one group with the other but within the same group we are comparing it and analyzing it the uses it helps in formulate a useful hypothesis and risk factors of disease or identifying a new disease informative for very rare disease with few established risk factors and may suggest emergence of new disease or epidemic that's very important disadvantage it cannot be used to test for presence of hello uh, dr rajesh yes, voice is my voice is coming right we are connected yes sir yes sir okay yes, sir, thank you so disadvantages it cannot be used to test the presence of valid statistical association due to absence of comparison group the third type of study under descriptive study is ecological studies ecological studies evaluate various secular trends and are studies where the trend of drug related outcomes are examined over time or across the continents for example when the covid outbreak was there the very first drug can you tell me anyone can name which was the first drug which were the first few drugs which was approved in when the outbreak started in china if you remember anyone the very first drugs which were tried and tested for covid 19 remdesivir remdesivir came actually quite after some time not not immediately and the drugs sir hard drug yeah okay fevipravir so, okay. first uh i think that also came very very late which started okay hydroxychloroquine okay yes but even before that there was a drug which had came into picture it is a, okay i will give you a hint it was a anti retroviral drug combination which was tried and tested anyone anyone can give a quick search it was a ritonavir combination anti retroviral drug which was the very very first drug which was tried and tested in covid time lopinavir and ritonavir combination if you remember anyone lopinavir ritonavir combination very very first drug and if you go and check the there were hundreds of clinical trials linked with this and then after that hydroxychloroquine came into picture then followed by that ivermectin fevipravir remdesivir steroids aspirin and many other more drugs like montelukast okay and any other mast cell stabilizers so many drugs and biologicals so ecological studies will help understand this type of trends which are emerging all over the world and helps you give an easy understanding where the trend of drug related outcomes are examined over time and or across the continents 
okay and it is a continuous effect and in these studies data from a single region can be analyzed to determine the change over time or data from a single time point and can be analyzed to compare one region versus another and i think this during this covid time many of you will be actually monitoring or keeping a track of the covid trackers the government of india has launched their own covid trackers then there was a world meter which was giving its own tracking okay device to track the outbreak of the epidemic how the drugs were used so like this even now we have vaccine trackers so all over the world what type of vaccines are being launched approved for covid 19 what phase of development they are what type of safety data we are getting so it keeps a trend analysis comes under ecological study design so group of subject is the in this is the unit of observation analysis and group may be according to place of resident or place of birth can be studied so you can do that so it's an appropriate design these are the uses where exposure measures at a population level when you are doing a study at population level you can use ecological study design and it is helpful in identifying factors responsible for risk differentiation between population then the risk variation between within the same population and useful for monitoring effectiveness of population intervention this is another very important i think during covid time there was an education drive which was carried out and there were actually studies which were carried out that is hand hygiene type of study awareness among the communities or at the population level about wearing of mask okay hand sanitization so at larger at population level okay or a big lockdown so there were studies that impact of lockdown on covid out outbreak pandemic or the slow progression of the pandemic how the lockdown actually helped slow progression so these type of studies are all come under your ecological study designs okay like immunization program how covid 19 vaccination will prevent future deaths or mortalities linked with covid 19 so immunization programs and future effects and screening programs how mass screening programs as we had seen in covid 19 that is mass testing of covid 19 samples how it has prevented the future outbreaks or slowed up slow down the progression of the virus so now you are understanding so ecological studies do play a very important role but next disadvantage since ecological studies do not provide data on individual rather they analyze study data based on study groups it is not only impossible to adjust for confounding variables but it does not reveal whether an individual with a disease of interest actually used that drug or not okay so that's very very difficult to understand okay so at the ground level difficult to understand but at the population level yes it has advantage now comes to cross sectional study okay till now anyone have any doubts anyone wants to ask any question anyone any doubts okay so coming next is cross sectional study so how common is this condition this is the first question we have to answer are condition and exposure associated with it and why we need cross sectional so if both exposure and outcomes are determined simultaneously for each subject we can use cross sectional study and case of disease identify our prevalence case as they exist as the study time and that is a prevalence studies we can use i will give you some more examples on that like single examination of a cross section of a population at one time we can use exposure and disease excess simultaneously as i told smoking and cancer same time they are analyzed and help generate hypotheses and provide information about frequency or characteristics we can use cross sectional studies so they provide information about frequency help to generate hypotheses and all those things will be there disadvantage it is difficult to establish association time of sequence of event they are not suitable to investigate rare diseases we cannot rare exposures also is a limitation and disease of short duration very difficult to analyze so being based on prevalent rather than incidental cases they are of limit value to investigate etiological relationship so even the relationship like getting some etiological relation very difficult now comes to analytical study designs in analytical study design i will back now i will tell you we, what we are saying. if you remember the analytical study design which will depend on the direction of research that is cohort exposure to outcome case cohort outcome to exposure and cross sectional they all will come under analytical study design 
So this table, do remember, which will be required for you. That is drug exposure, not rare. Prevalence, not rare. If cohort, if it is drug exposure, not rare. Prevalence is rare. It is case control. If it is not rare outcome, rare drug exposure, it is cohort. And then rare and rare case cohort. So these will help you understand the next part of my topic. That is, okay, analytical study, which is divided into case control study. Cross-sectional study, cohort studies, and hybrid studies. Case control study, if you remember, it is a type of observational study in which two existing groups differing in outcomes are identified and compared on basis of some supposed causal attributes. Case control studies are often used to identify factors that may contribute to a medical condition by comparing subject who have that condition or disease, which patient do not have condition or otherwise previously controlled. So over here, you can see in case control, you have an outcome and you are looking for what type of exposure a patient may have. So participants are selected based on the outcome. So what ultimately outcome they have, for example, I will select lung cancer patient and I will go back and look for what type of exposure a lung cancer patient may have. Either it is a smoking exposure or a, you can see industrial pollutants or air pollution or dietary habits or any other exposure, which may be linked to a disease, I will look for. The odd ratio among cases are compared to the odd ratios among non-cases. So odd ratios will be calculated and study multiple determinants of single outcomes that are rare also will be. Okay, so example already I had given you, so I will not waste much time on that. Other type of studies are cross-sectional. We had already discussed in the previous. They can also be analytical types that they are attempting to demonstrate an association between an exposure and an outcome. So when you are establishing any association between an exposure and outcome, it can come under cross-sectional. Okay, give me a second. Okay. The next type of studies are cohort study. It can be a prospective cohort. It can be a retrospective cohort. Prospective cohort means if you are going along with the type. For example, if I recruit a patient now and I will follow these patients for longer duration of time, that is in the coming days, I will follow them up. They are prospective cohort study. Retrospective cohort study means the study, the patient had already gone from the hospital, but I know his disease, I know his outcomes. So I will go back and look for the data, the previous data. But in retrospective study designs, always the problem is the reliability and credibility of data because missing data will be a lot. If in case your hospitals or your research settings, you don't have a robust uh, document practice in which the hospital do have, like some may have, some may not have. So you have to make sure that your hospital or your research, you are doing research, should have a very retrospective database. Definitely, Retrospective cohorts can be. So, elements of cohorts are like selection of study subjects, obtaining selection of direction of inquiry. So, you can see over here there is a Uh, uh, I thought voice is not... Sir, it's actually no. uh, your voice is not clear uh, for past one minute. Past one, I think maybe internet connectivity issue. Give me one. Now, uh, now it is clear? Now, now it's clear, sir. Okay. I think I got disconnected. I think network. Okay. Yes, it's uh, not connected. Now. Fine. So, in cohort study, if you see, there is a time which is moving forward. The direction of inquiry also going. That is in the forward direction. And then you have a population with you. In the population, you have patients, persons <laughs> which are without diseases. Okay. Then in those group of patients, there is one group which is exposed and the other group which is unexposed. So you are going to follow both the groups. In the time inquiry, 
and then you will see in the exposed group how many patients how many people develop disease and in the exposed group how many doesn't develop the disease there is no disease at all whereas in the other group if you see there is an unexposed group so definitely in the unexposed group also there will be some patient who will develop the disease and who will not develop the disease so this is what you have to compare for example if i'm doing a study on lung cancer patient and in lung cancer patient i want to okay so in the beginning if there is a population then there is a population which is without disease so i take 100 patients in that and out of those 100 patient there will be 50 patient 50 person who are actually smokers and there are another 50 people who are non smoker so in the exposed group that is who are smoker okay so those who are smoker how many of them will develop lung cancer and how many of them will not develop lung cancer that you have to check then in the unexposed group those who are non smoker in non smoker group also you may have some people who will develop the disease maybe the number may be less but definitely they will develop a disease and there will be people who will not develop the disease so this is what a cohort is but please note there are instance cohort studies are a time consuming study it requires lot of resources lot of manpower and there are chances when the dropout rates are very high all this remember the golden rule if for example if you are doing a study and your study is for a very short duration for example 6 months or 1 year the number of patients who will be completing your study will be very high when compared to a study when you are having a follow up period of around 3 years or a 5 year so the more longer the duration of study the more number of follow ups the chance of dropouts are very high is it clear to all of you so these are some of the disadvantage which are linked with cohort but the cohorts give you a very good understanding of a disease in long term the turkish syphilis study was actually a cohort long term cohort but actually it was only meant for around 6 months or maximum up to 3 years but it went up to 40 years but normally cohorts can go up to 3 to 5 years also or even sometime even 10 years cohort depend on the study and who is sponsoring it so general considerations while selection of cohort so both the cohort the study cohort and comparison cohorts are free of diseases both group should equally susceptible to the disease both should have the same environment and the same condition and the both the group should be comparable that is both group should have equal representation of males and female age group should be almost similar it should not be like that one group you are having an age group of around 60 and above and in the control group you have a age group of around 40 45 so both the group should have an equal representation with respect to gender disease age and others plus minus some up and down can be there then you have diagnostics and eligibility criteria of disease should be defined clearly then as i already told you have two different type prospective retrospective nowadays even mb directional both retro and prospective study combination can be there so a prospective cohort is a study you can see it starts the exposure is there it goes along with the time and there is a disease occurrence during the time frame so that is what a prospective cohort so study start you give a exposure and patient is having disease occurrence retrospective means if you see the study starts when the disease has already occurred so you have a disease which is already occurred and you are going back actually and checking what type of exposure a patient may have that is retrospective study going back and checking so cohort studies already we had done so participants are reduced based on the exposure users of drugs are compared to non users for rarely used drugs or when they are multiple outcomes for single exposure establish your temporal relation between exposure and outcome and selection bias is less in cohort disadvantage it needs the need for large number of patients is very high more expensive than other designs as i already told it is very very expensive vulnerable to bias if a high number of participants are lost during the follow up that is a high dropout rate as i already told the longer the duration dropout rates are very very high and it adds to the cost because initially you have to go for higher sample size 
and as the sample size goes up the cost goes up so for a research institute or a sponsor they may be very very costly so the study population is frequently dynamic because the amount of time during which a subject is observed vary from subject to subject information from automated database with reimbursement or healthcare information can be used for retrospective research so case cohort study as already i had told case cohort means the exposure is already there and covariated information is collected from all cases the control are random representation samples selected from original cohort rare outcomes or when outcome has a long induction time l latency then especially when the outcome is rare exposure is rare it can be used for example you have exposure you have an outcome okay these are cohort study for example as i told you about your uh, amoxicillin and steven johnson it can be come under this particular scenario hybrid study many a times sometime they some researchers may use mixed study they can combine one or two different study designs into one and they can carry out the research depend on the objectives so these study design combine several standard epidemiological design with resulting increased efficacy in these studies case are selected on basis of outcomes and drug use in comparison with drug use of several different types of comparison groups these are some of the different new designs nested control case cohort case time studies so subject in different same cohorts with same directions and finally we had already discussed about randomized controlled trial which is one of the most strongest of all study designs i will say a single randomized controlled trial can actually change the way how we do research or how we practice medicine or how we look at the whole scenario at all so for example if you are doing systematic reviews if any one of you had read any systematic reviews many a times when you are shortlisting your articles for carrying out a systematic review randomized control clinical trials are the one which actually it is the first articles which you are going to shortlist for your research and based on that because many times always remember that for example if someone has done a randomized control trial in america their results may differ someone has done in india on same objectives results may differ in europe results may differ maybe someone has done on a thousand patient randomized trial someone may have done on 100 patient someone on 500 so there are different study population study objectives but ultimate outcomes are same so when you do a systematic review or a meta analysis so you are going to synthesize all those evidence you are going to collect all these evidence and you are going to screen these articles for randomized trials okay so a randomized controlled trial is a specific type of scientific experiment and preferred design for a clinical trial randomized controlled trial are often used to test the efficacy of various type of intervention and rct may also provide an opportunity to gather useful information about adverse effects such as drug actions randomized patients associations are likely to be causal association disadvantages impossible to perform ethically many times and ethically and logistically issues are very common in this it is expensive and many times little bit artificial that's why what happen is in phase 3 trials when we do human trials when we do a randomized control trial there will be a lot of check and balance inclusion exclusion criteria so sometime what happen when we do randomized trial it may not actually reflect the actual population which is the target population <coughs> so that's why many time when a drug is launched in the market okay the results sometime you can get differently because the inclusion exclusion criteria will not be there when the drug is launched in the market okay when compared to a randomized trial so that's all for this particular and these are some of the references which i had used anyone have any questions i will be happy to answer few questions before i have another 10 minutes left with me anyone have any questions i will be happy to answer if yeah, you have, you any, have doubts, any questions we will discuss with sir now also we can discuss after the 10 minutes presentation only 
if anything okay okay i will be taking another 5 or 10 slides to actually tell them that's what i told in the beginning of my uh, lecture about how to go for biomedical literature evaluation because sure, it's sure. one of the very very important point for research step like how to carry out the research because article selection is very important and many a times many researchers young researchers have problem selecting what type of article they should select for so biomedical literature evaluation is a first step towards evidence collection or evidence synthesis i will say or if someone is actually doing evidence based medicines or or any other research so this is a very important step so let's start i will just spend 10 minutes i will quickly i will not cover whole but i will quickly come across the most important points so biomedical as you know activities and application of science in clinical medicine and literature is referred to as the body of article published in biomedical and scientific journals and evaluation is a systematically assessing the merits worth and significance of one treatment with another now this is the critical appraisal of a literature evaluation that is very important is your ability to read a research paper for example when you go in net the very first thing what we do is we will go to google we will search an article and thousand and thousand of hits you get maybe for example if you hit only search diabetes and clinical trials you may get a maybe 1000 10000 1 lakh hits so out of those so many articles which article you are going to select okay so this is what it is all about so ability to read research paper is very important to judge its scientific value very important and that can be applied in practice so when you are reading an article these are the things which you have to keep in mind these are the very step by step approach to evaluate the literature the very first thing is is the title and abstract the article you are reading is interesting if it is yes if you find the title interesting you will go to the next step if no you may discard the article that's what normally happen if you don't find the title interesting you don't read it further are the study result adequately reported if yes you go next if no you may discard the article were appropriate statistical analysis were used in the article whether proper methods were used statistical tools were used or methods were applied then if it is yes go to the next step are the study subject similar to those seen in clinical practice or is it hypothetical group for example whatever the study group they had taken whether it actually represents the actual patient group in the public in the clinical scenario if it is yes is it useful is it used as an agent feasible in clinical setting if yes are the result clinically significant if yes are the benefit of treatment worth the risk that is a risk benefit ratio if it is yes the article will be useful in the clinical practice so these are some of the steps which we go while selecting an article then other type of steps which we use is what type of journal it is getting published what is which investigator is behind that article what is the research site and what are the research fundings which are available the conflict of interest nowadays selecting a journal is very very difficult then government of india or at the world stage we have some rating agencies which actually rate various journals based on the impact factor based on the quality for example you have a scopus indexing in which you have various categorization like q1 q2 q3 and q4 then you have another category like web of science journals so all these rating agencies <coughs> depend on the credibility of a journal depend on the citation depend on the worth of the journal okay how much time they are being referred or uh, they will be ranking them okay so evaluation of journal starts published in a reputable journal so your reputable journal you can see whether it is indexed in these domains or not these websites like scopus web of science or have an a high impact factor or not then it will give you whether it is reputable or not and during peer review process many scripts are critic by a panel of experts so whether that particular journal which you are selecting whether they have a robust manuscript check or not whether they have a panel of experts to check the article quality or not 
an investigator have training and expertise a good track record so whichever the investigator is writing this paper you can actually check his background what type of previous research paper he has published whether he has that expertise or not so all these things can be analyzed and a biostatistician assisted in evaluation of data and whether in the authors any biostatistician or an expert who can handle the data whether he is available or not so all these things add value to the research and whether the study authored entirely by the investigator in pharmaceutical industry or is it a multidisciplinary research and to be listed as authors one should have actually contributed to the research the research site should have appropriate resources and technology and sufficient subjects and the source of funding should be noted that's very very important let's come to some of the components of a research journal that is the title what the title it should be very brief and it should be catchy and should tag uh, like it should attract the attention of the reader and indicate what article is all about without drawing any conclusion please note whenever you are writing your own title for example if you are publishing a research article make sure your title is such that it reflects actually what you are doing but without drawing any conclusion and also the abstract should be very brief it should give an overview of the study now in abstract you have two different types one is structured abstract and one is normal abstract structured abstracts normally in which you may be having a background you may be having a methodology result section conclusion section will be there whereas a normal you can say abstract will be just a small paragraph concise draft abstract and when you are writing an introduction the background information should be given objective should be clearly stated and research and another hypothesis should be properly formulated and any ethical issue should be addressed in the introduction part and in the methodology the contain information on research study design should be clearly stated what research study design is being taken up what type of population study population you are targeting what type of instrumentations or what type of uh, scales you are using maybe quality of life tools or any other instruments or any method which you are using and what are the various outcome variables and statistics should be described and it should be detailed to allow investigator to reproduce the results this is very important reproducibility is very important and ethos should state that the protocol is available upon request then these are the study designs i will not go these are study designs go for these are already we had covered then you have evaluating parameters for systematic reviews in case if you are carrying systematic reviews and not only that please note before when you are selecting a journal the authors institute from where it is it's very important institute names the authors profile all are very important and funding declaration all very important for a journal then you have evaluating parameters for systematic review what type of research question whether it is covering both published and unpublished results inclusion and exclusion criteria is given or not methodologies of the studies are given or not blinding source of funding homogeneity of test test of if meta analysis is carried out and whether competence interval or what type of error is there so all these things becomes a part of data evaluation so what type of results whether they published or not study validity okay all these things when you are reading an article so i'm not going in much detail but definitely all is required when you are looking at literature okay different key points you have to look at okay okay that's all from my side i will be happy to take few questions if you have i think it's almost 6 now if anyone have any questions i will be happy to answer i hope i conveyed a little bit added to your knowledge anyone Sir, any class questions was really, class was really perfect and everything was covered and even okay, uh, you thank know, you dr rajesh it was amazing sir so if anyone have the thank questions you, you can ask sir excuse me sir yes yes, yes please, please ask yes sir uh, in case uh, any study the result of the study comes negative then that study is published or not uh, okay uh, so that's what i think i had talked in the beginning of my topic also the negative results also sometimes becomes very important but it is up to the researcher that how much negative results he want to put up in his you can say research article but definitely if you are putting negative results also it gives a positive side of a researcher 
and definitely the editor of the journal he cannot reject just because you had put some negative results because the research community should actually see what has come positive and what has come negative so nowadays even and especially if you see covid research many papers that's why now when we see the initial papers which were coming out of these drug like hydroxychloroquine take example when the initial outbreak was there all the research papers which were published they were on a positive side for hydroxychloroquine but as the time passes as the study duration increased and as more and more research study design and robust study designs were included the negative part of hydroxychloroquine started coming out and the risk and be benefit balance actually shifted towards the risk side more and that's why the hydroxychloroquine was removed actually so now you understand so it is a uh, equally important nowadays to present your negative results also but you have to present very smartly how you are presenting it okay it won't give uh, any please, uh, i want to effect about the i author. want to add it to this i want to add it to sir uh, uh, mr yoti the thing is see, we always uh, you know should publish the negative results there are the journals a few journals the good journals who uh, you know which are just accepting the negative results why i'll tell you two things behind that what is the reason because see if you are not publishing the re negative results that means someone else will will repeat that uh, you know mistake someone else will repeat that experiment and again they will fail so publishing negative results will you know save the time of other researchers save the funds which are very important in the research okay and save the you know uh, human resources and you know all the laboratory resources everything so it is very important to publish the negative results because once you publish the negative results other people other researchers you know uh, other people will also you know uh, will not go for that path again they will think of something else they will find out they will try to find out like what was the mistakes in the past research why they, they why did they get the negative results what were the you know mistakes in methodology they will try to find out the mistakes they will try to find out the you know uh, whatever has happened in the methodology or you know choosing the participants or choosing the population or uh, you know anything so they will not waste the time money and resources that's why it is important to publish the negative results and there are few very specific journals which publish only negative results so it's very important yes and especially as a young researcher for example if you are doing any research in the hospitals on any drug for example then for example if you are publishing only positive results and not telling about for example side effects they are a very common thing right. and for example right. if you are doing a research on maybe 1000 patient and you are comparing two different drug therapies and you are just telling which is better like in terms of efficacy and when it comes to the side effects you tell okay there is no side effect are there so that means sometimes researchers who are not projecting negative results it may give a wrong that like uh, you can say wrong part of a researcher to a publisher okay so definitely do look for negatives okay and you have to justify that why what was the reason that this type of adverse outcome has come out what were the reasons for that that's how the science grows okay oh, oh, oh. and yeah, as dr if you're not told, publishing if you're not publishing negative result again the new aspect sir has discussed now you know you are playing with the life of patients you are playing with the yes, life yes, of yes. population which is who is going to take the drug definitely yes yes because actually we will be doing bias in that if we are not publishing our negative results it will be a research bias right. yes yes when you uh, you earlier talked about bias yes anyone else any other question okay then there is one question in chat sir uh, so i think uh, aparna is asking can you give a short explanation about the steps to publish a research study okay uh, steps to publish a research study okay so the most important aspect is uh if you are like a very young researcher okay then for example if you are in third year or a fourth year you can as i told already you can start practicing on maybe a review article okay you can collaborate with your uh, you can say teachers for a short review articles it can be a mini review it can be you can start with a short review or a meta analysis you can begin with that or if you are a student of a medical background like you are a pharmacy student or you are going in the wards along with your uh, doctors so you can look for some of the case reports or case series in the hospitals that's how you can begin with and once you have a practice like a case reports a short review articles a letter to editor and then you can start planning a bigger research studies in your maybe in your fifth year 
or maybe in your mpharm research you can start practicing a bigger studies so that is how we actually go for about publishing a research a studies in actual practices so it's a step by step practice you have to start writing and also there are different softwares available like there are end notes of software available for practicing how to write references okay so there are reference softwares available and during the due course try to understand about plagiarism issues okay like how in a research article plagiarisms and how not to cross plagiarisms then understanding different aspects grammatical issues now now there are softwares available for like grammarly okay so these are small small aspects of a research so which you can start developing and also whenever you are studying study designs like statistics so statistics is a very very important part of any research so what i recommend is actually like you can find those sources which are there in your academics or you can go for site and i think dr ajit has some courses on statistics so statistics actually i will say is the heart of all research so if you know the yeah. statistics what method you want to apply at what time for what type of result i think that is the key to success and i think if you know how to play with the data and you know the statistics and the software i think the whole scenario change and then you have the good writing skills so you have to practice and practice for writing a research paper the more you read articles the more you understand for example if you want to write a meta analysis for example so the easiest way is download 10 meta analysis in that area or domain or maybe similar and see what is the structure of that article so that will give you an easy platform to write your own article i think that is a beginning point if you want to start writing and i think maybe dr rajit if you want to add some points and i think you have a very huge database of research publication i think dr rajit if you want to add please add few more points uh sir definitely you are very right that uh, you know if uh, you know the students want to start the research and if they have the interest in research they can definitely start with some review papers in their third years or fourth years uh, you know if you are doing pharm d or if they are in the pharm or you know m pharm they can start writing some uh, you know review articles and something and if it is uh, if as he is asking about the publication i think then uh, you know definitely first of all you should uh, think of your uh, you know area whatever uh, you know the area of interest then look into that what are the research gap identified what are the you know research gaps and then based on that you can you know find out a good topic you can find out a good objective and then based on that you can if you want to go for original research or if you want to go for meta analysis if you want to go for review article you can start writing and target some good journals based on that based on your article based on your objective based on the you know subject uh, of your paper and then definitely there are the guidelines every each each and every journal have their own you know authors guidelines instruction to authors and based on that this submission is uh, not a tough process so you can submit and you can you know try but as sir said it is very important to you know keep in mind about uh, you know grammar and about the uh, plagiarism about you know the sentences language everything so that you can start learning from you know uh, your uh, you know third year or fourth year and then you can develop that habit to write the papers so no one is uh, you know the expert from the first paper or no one is expert from the first thing so you have to practice it you have to you know uh, taste the failure also you have to taste the you know rejections of the papers and then definitely uh, you know after a few times or after you know maybe one or two papers you will be expert and you will be you know uh, getting new topics in your mind you will be you will be getting you know new topics new, new subjects and uh, you know new objectives to do and then uh, it is easy to publish so you know i think uh, yes. uh, we have published i think more than 50 papers i have published more than 50 papers dr kanav khera has uh, published more than 20 papers i think more than 30 papers so we have good database it is just about the practice and you know uh, like to you know uh, go for new topics always and think of like okay we have to do something we have to publish it we have to write some review papers we have to write some meta analysis and systematic research that's all about you know your passion of research passion towards the research and and one more one more very important point the editors will also for example if you submit that's what dr rajit very rightly told you have to taste the failure also when you are publishing but when you are tasting that failure the editors of the journals will be giving you very important inputs that on yes. what basis they are rejecting your article so i think that is a very good learning for all the young researchers to take those key points from the editors the reasons Absolutely. of failure to and then when you are submitting next time you keep on working on that so always Absolutely. you can improve your own articles your own research by 
under learning from your own comments of your articles so i think Absolutely. that is a very important self learning yes and always remember a research is a collaborative effort so in case exactly. if you are weak in one aspect do take help so never hesitate in taking help of any other person in the research because always remember True. it's a collective effort not an individual effort it's a collective effort True. okay so, i think someone has raised the hand do you have any question dr s x sir my uh, doctor uh, sorry doctor ji that before joining your class uh, there is some easy way to understand statics p value interval value this one because i'm planning to join your class okay this is a static class before that can okay. we need something like reference uh, till that we'll prepare for class um okay so uh, i think we can we can uh, talk on this you can contact on my number i think you have my okay. you have my number yes yeah, sir i'm dr azim i'll do contact you ah azim yes yes yeah. sure sure um, because yeah, i'm sure. for my phd this one i need that one so i want to join definitely, this class definitely definitely ah, okay. definitely i'll okay. contact you your sure. personal number okay sure, thank sure, you sure 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 yeah. yeah thank you okay so if everything is okay if no more questions then we can uh, you know uh wind up and uh, we'll see you guys and your certificates you, will, 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 will be delivered by tomorrow Okay, guys. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, both of you. Thank you so much. It is really thank nice you, class, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Good day. Good day.